to do with polar coordinates. I had a question in the other section about, okay, I can write down the integrand for a polar coordinate problem, integral problem that is, but I have difficulty setting up the limits of integration. Okay, so let's, uh, let's try that again. I picked a problem from your textbook, problem 808, or page 808, number 7. Now it just reeks of polar coordinates because what they do is give you polar coordinate <coughs> functions to begin with, to deal with. So there's no question that it's a polar coordinate problem. What they ask you to do, let me just try to read it, is find mass and centroid for a region that's inside r equals 3 sine theta, outside r equals 1 plus sine theta, and density is inversely proportional to distance from the pole. Well, all those words say polar coordinates. What I think you will find trouble with is, again, visualizing what the region is, and that's what I've been trying to hop up and down on you about. You can't get very far in these problems just pushing algebraic equations around. I mean, you can get some things, but you're not going to get everything. You really have to have some kind of a picture, at least a mental picture, and preferably something you've written down, of what the region is. In this case, for example, this one right here, if you check back in your notes or your textbook, you will see that there are some classic polar coordinate equations. R equals A cosine theta, R equals B sine theta. Now, either know those or at least have the ability to quickly sketch what they might look like. For example, let's just take the first one up here. R equals A cosine theta. Well, make up a little table. Here's theta, here's R. If you don't know what it is, put in some values. Zero, pi over four, pi over two, and then kind of look around and see what else you need. When theta is equal to zero, cosine's one, we get A. So, when you're looking down the x-axis, you're supposed to be out here A units. That's one point. At pi over four, square root of two over two, Uh, somehow you've got to figure out where that is. Pi over 2, a lot easier. The cosine is now 0, where it's 0. So at pi over 4, I guess that's the interesting one. If you can figure out where square root of 2 over 2 a's are, you might find something like that. Uh, how about um, 3 pi over 4? What's that going to be? Cosine of that is? Negative. Now I'm asking you, basically, do you really know what the cosine curve itself looks like? Here's theta and cosine theta. So here we are at pi over 2. Here's 3 pi over 4. The one we're looking for, here's pi, gets us down here to minus 1. Okay, so it's the negative of this. And this is where things get a little tough. What you do is say, well, I'm supposed to be standing and looking out this way at... Uh, 3 pi over 4 for theta, but the instructions to say march backwards. Okay, clump, 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 clump. Here you are back here again. And then when you're at uh, pi, stick that in here, cosine theta is a negative one. Same story. I'm looking down the negative x-axis, but it says to back up to a again. And the effect is that when you go from 0 to pi, you've in effect swept out everything that you're interested in. If you go from pi to 2 pi, you'll just go through the circuit again. With a few more points, what you uh, are supposed to imagine anyway is that you can fill out a circle there. Now, I've just spent two minutes that I shouldn't have spent. You should realize that those kinds of equations there are circles or disks if it's supposed to be a lamina. If A is positive, it's over here. If A is negative, it would be a disk on this side. And the sine theta, positive A on top, negative A on the bottom. Just know that. Don't waste your time having to reconstruct calculus 2, in effect. This one. Now, that one's supposed to be a giveaway. Anyone know what it is? Okay, you could plot it, but you're probably would be better off if you realize that it's a cardioid. Cardioids look like A, 1 plus cosine theta, or B, 1 plus sine theta. 
And so that's the one we have, the one plus sine theta. If you know it's a cardioid, about half the problem's over. The question is, which cardioid is it? Well, let's throw in a point. Uh, theta equals 0, r equals 1. Theta equals pi over 2, the sine is 1, we're up here at 2. Theta equals pi, sine is 0 again, we're back to 1. Theta equals uh, this one, we're back at the origin. Quickly again, you will find that the cardioid you've just swept out, if you know it's a cardioid, you now ha know it has that particular shape there. So it's pretty much the same story as with the disc. The cosine cardioid is one side or the other, left to right. The sine cardioid, top to bottom, depending on what the A and the B are. Now, other than that, and ones that you also should be familiar with, for example, R equals sine in theta or cosine in m theta or something like that. Anyone happen to know what those are? Those are those uh, multi-petaled flowers, depending on whether n is even or odd. Okay, if you know that, great. If you don't, you might go back and look at a few pictures to see what's going on. But again, we haven't done anything for double integrals yet, so let's get going here. We have this as our cardioid, and we've got our disk over here. This one turns out to be a disk that comes out to three units. It has a diameter of three. So let's kind of put those together. Oops, wrong one. Told you one thing, got another one. I should have done the, the sine one. That was the one on top. Okay, let's do it here. Sine three theta will be a disc, something like that. Of course, I could draw that perfectly, but I want to give you the feeling that you don't have to be a great artist to do these things. You know, just kind of roughly what's going on. And secondly, that that cardioid we came up with seems to have this kind of a shape. And if I read my instructions, it says inside the disk and outside the cardioid are bounded by the two. Bounded by the two is not too good because there are all kinds of little regions like that. But it is inside the disk and outside the cardioid. I think it's this shape up top here, this uh, kind of a crescent shape. So that's the disk in question, not the disk, I should say, the uh, lamina in question inside the disk, outside the cardioid. Well, we have our region. Now we're supposed to find, for example, mass. To begin with, it's the same old story. One says, well, it's the mass of little pieces of the region, and then you add them up through this two-dimensional region, a double integral. Again, I hope that symbol says something to you. It's supposed to give you information or allow you to remember things kind of easily. Little bits of mass, density times small bits of area, added up in two dimensions throughout your region. This time, though, we're trying to use polar coordinates. So that says we would take these kinds of shapes for our little masses. Those are our polar shapes. For better names, I don't know. Right there in the middle is supposed to be coordinates r and theta. Okay, we found that the area of this thing in polar coordinates is r dr d theta, where d theta is this angular increment, dr is this radial increment. That you're just supposed to know. It's, I'm afraid there's nothing much more to do. You don't want to derive that every time either, but that's the case here. You were told that the density, I think, is inversely proportional to distance from the origin. So that point right there with coordinates r and theta has what distance to the origin? r. So it's simply k over r. This is rho as a function of polar coordinates that we're talking about. So the integrand is pretty easy. Something you memorize and something that should be obvious from just plain old polar coordinates. 
The difficulty, as I think I warned you a couple of times, has to do with actually writing down the limits of integration. Most anyone should be able to integrate or put down what the integrand is, but setting it up in terms of limits is the tough part. What's the difference? A lot or not much at all. When you were doing Cartesian coordinates with increments and x and y, one naturally added vertically and horizontally in the x and y variables. One does naturally the same thing, although it looks different. One adds radially to get a, well, from here anyway, this kind of a little piece of mass. And then one adds angularly all the way about to get the total mass that you're after. So there's your two-dimensional addition, except this time it's radial and angular. So your double integral is shaping up kind of nicely. It turns out that because functions are generally given in terms of theta, r is a function of theta, most of the time I think you'll find this will be the order in which you do your evaluation. That's not always the case, but I think most of the time. We've gotten the integrand already. That was pretty easy. K over r, r dr d theta. In fact, you can't ask for much more than that. Your r's cancel. That's kind of nice. OK, here comes the, the part that you have to kind of recall in terms of Cartesian coordinates. This is to be fixed while I'm doing something with the r. OK, fixed theta means I'm stuck basically along a line. Remember, theta equals pi over 4 is not just an angle. In polar coordinates, theta equals pi over 4 is the 45 degree line. It's all points r theta, where r is anything, any radial distance, and theta is fixed at pi over 4. That's a 45 degree line. So for a fixed theta, we're looking along a line. And I want r to move along that line, basically, from the inside to the outside. Well, that should be obvious for fixed theta. That means we go from the cardioid out to the disk. I think I had enough up there. That's supposed to be 3 sine theta. That was the equation of the disk up here. That gives us the little pi shape, although we don't have the full pi shape, just this little piece out here. And now we have to add angularly. And that's not trivial in this particular problem because it doesn't start at any old famous angle. What we have to do is start adding from whatever this angle is, because these don't intersect on the x-axis, for example, all the way around to whatever this angle is. Uh, my picture doesn't indicate it, but this is symmetrical. And if we have that angle, we'll have both of them. So where do these two curves meet? Typical Cartesian coordinate problem. But in terms of polar coordinates, it's where this r would equal the other r for a specific r and theta. What we're looking for is a r. It would be nice, but theta in particular, that satisfies both equations simultaneously. That would be a, a common point of intersection. If you solve that, I think you're going to get sine theta equals a half. So theta, for our picture, would be pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6. So those are the, the summation limits for the theta. And that would be the mass. OK, go on and integrate. Don't think you have much trouble there. Now, what if you have to do uh, a centroid problem? Where is the center of mass for this particular shape? Anyone know where the x bar is? Yep, x bar should be up, well, 0, or the center of mass ought to be on the y axis, not because of geometrical symmetry, but because of the symmetry of the density function. This plate over here is density-wise exactly the same as the one over here. That's what you have to pay attention to. So we can find that this thing will rest on the y-axis without tipping. The question is, where is the center of mass? Now, I've put it up here. I bet you, though, it's more likely right down here. So if a few days ago, I said, when you do a center of mass problem, make sure it's inside the region. What I was thinking was what we call a convex region. 
And this is not one of those, so you might have a center of mass outside the region if you, in this particular situation. So we think that the x bar is zero. What are we going to do for y bar? Okay, well, uh, my students in the other class say that they're just learning this in their physics course. I don't know about you people. I assume there are umpteen physics courses going on. But it turns out to be just like Cartesian coordinates. What you need for your center of mass is that old lever arm times mass product added up. Of course, we're going to integrate the thing. Lever arm for this one, if we want our y bar, has to do with this lever arm right here. Okay, you take your lever arm, which is with respect to the x-axis, that's y, times your mass and add it up. Okay, so that says m sub x, uh, which one am I doing? It's opposite of the one we want. Let's, let me write it this way. Yep, that's uh, the moment with respect to the x-axis. I always get those backwards. Moment with respect to the x-axis, you're supposed to put a lever arm of y in distance to the x-axis times the mass, double integral, over the same region. So you have the same limits of integration. The question I'm posing is, uh, can you tell me what that lever arm should be? It shouldn't be y. What should it be in polar coordinates? Only one half-hearted answer. Anybody else? What's that a lever arm? What is that distance right there? That point is r theta. What's the distance to the x-axis? r sine theta, right. That's just your plain old substitution from polar to Cartesian or backwards, whichever way you look at it. So when you're doing centroids, you need to change, of course, your lever arm to the appropriate polar lever arm. If it's a second moment of inertia, well, you square that thing, r squared sine squared theta, et cetera. So the transition is rather easy. Everything, I think, is easy except possibly putting down the right limits of integration. So when you're doing your homework problems, please try to get those things written down. Uh, my personal opinion is whether or not you can integrate what you have written down is something that uh, should go back to calculus, too. I want to see the right things written down in the first place. Any questions on that one? I think it entails pretty much what you're going to see from this course on polar coordinates. You might see them again in some other course. You can say you saw it here first, if you saw it. Okay, let's go on. Talked about mass. Let me give you another mass problem. This particular elliptic paraboloid we've been kicking around since the beginning of the semester. So I'm going to take that hill, consider it a solid above the xy plane, and what I want to do is find mass for that thing. Density is proportional to some distance. Okay, we'll put that on the back burner. I mean, that's important, but right now, what is significantly different is that we are no longer talking about laminas or plates. We're talking about real thick solids in three dimensions. What we found out from, <coughs> I hope this analysis over here, 
where we found out from any problem that you do is really a review of what Newton did a long time ago, mid-1600s. He took a complicated situation, broke it up into little pieces, you know, took this crescent, in effect, broke it up into little pieces of mass, and then added them all up, took a limit, and with calculus you can evaluate the thing. Okay. Well, probably Newton didn't worry about laminas like this. He's the guy with the apple problem. And that was a solid. He was worried about gravitation between solids, spheres, or whatever you want to deal with. So he would be dealing with exactly this kind of problem right here. He's got a solid. He needs to find the mass of it and some other things, but this is a good place to start. I don't think this is going to work over here because who would ever divide up a three-dimensional solid into little plates? It's just not going to work, it turns out. You really have to do things in three dimensions. We've seen this picture over and over, so I'll make a rather quick sketch of it. And let's see, the intercepts look like radi 2 radical 3 and 3 and 36 up here. It's an elliptic paraboloid. looks like a nose cone or a hill is the way we looked at it before. And what we're saying is that if you are at some point out here with coordinates x, y, and z, then the, the density is proportional to distance down to the xy plane. Now that's trivial. Uh, density, now a function of three variables, is proportional to distance from the point to the xy plane. That means z. Z is that distance, the altitude, what we called it before. So that's pretty easy. High school physics tells us that if you look at a little chunk of mass here, let's say it's uh, got volume delta V, then your high school physics would say that the mass of that chunk would be nearly the density times the volume. I still claim that's high school physics, not that nearly, but the fact that if this is a really a small chunk of volume, again, same old story, sounds like a broken record. If it's a small chunk of volume, the density is nearly constant, so nearly constant homogeneous means density times volume is mass. Of course, density will be in grams per cubic centimeter, and your volume will be in cube centimeters, so you'll get your grams back again. And this is the way Newton would have tacked a problem. He's broken up into little pieces. He's now figured out what the little piece is like. And he goes back and says, well, for the total, what we need to do is add things up. Well, let me back off one more step than we saw here. Once we have one of these little blocks, what we ought to do is add up throughout the region Let's give it a name. Your book likes to call this region Q. So we'll do that. Okay, that triple sigma sign means you add up with some kind of rule all those little blocks of mass. throughout the region Q. Now that, that triple integral means you have to, <coughs> pardon me, triple sum, tipping my hand here. A triple sum means you have to add in three directions, three-dimensional problem. At this point, you'd only have an approximation. <coughs> and I suppose in some situations that's the best you can do. You could, may have to tackle the problem with a computer at this point if you only have some data points, let's say. But if the world is good to you and things are fairly nice, if you take the limit as, again, a broken record, 
the number of blocks goes to infinity. As their dimensions all go to zero in some nice way, you will have just the thing you're looking for. Okay, so that's the Newtonian approach to finding the mass. Break it up in little pieces, figure them out, and then add them back up. What do you get out of this? Well, that was the definition. Next step, what you get is a symbol. What you will get is this thing. Three sigmas become three elongated S's. And delta M, we could say dm. That's good enough. More likely, we might as well do it right here. We should substitute rho times dv because that's, again, the high school physics equality. The little bits of mass are density times volume. And then you add, that's what the sigmas and these integral signs mean, add over the region Q. Now, you can't see it from the back row, maybe, but I've got these quote marks here. Like that little story I told you last time, when you're in grammar school, the answer was x. Uh, right now, your answers are going to be this thing. And it's going to be probably a lot of work to really figure out what this thing is and then figure out how to evaluate this thing. I left you last time with basically the same thing for double integrals. And at the next stage, I'll do this a little bit later on maybe, I said there are th really three basic approaches we could take. First, use iteration. We're going to do that almost exclusively in this course. Second, computer approximations. You just did one. Double integral required two loops. You could take that same program, basically add a third loop on it, and you've got a, a method for finding triple integrals approximately. Okay. We won't ask you to do that. And lastly, for this course anyway, change a variable. And we're going to do a couple of those as well. Cylindrical coordinates, which really are just glorified polar coordinates, and something that's quite different, so-called spherical coordinates. You may or may not have heard of those already. So let's get back to iteration. Remember, these elongated S's mean sum. Sum in three directions this time. Okay, before we get going on that, let's put in the integrand. We figured out what it was. Density is kz. dv, well, let's see where all this came from. Remember, we had that little block hanging around. It was, used to be anyway, a little plate dx by dy. Just throw in an extra dz for Cartesian coordinates. So dv would be a product of those three increments in any order that you wish. And for today, I'm just going to do it the natural way. I think it's most natural. We'll do dz first, dy, and dx. Because in the iteration, what I first want to do is add up vertically my little blocks of mass. So let me come back to this picture. Here's this one little block over here sitting out here in three space. You're supposed to imagine that there are some underneath, maybe some above up to the surface. What I first want to do is add my blocks, like an elevator, bottom to top, from the xy plane up to the nose cone shape or the hill, whichever you like, the elliptic paraboloid. So what used to be my block mass, density times volume, has now become a column mass. by simply adding one on top of the other. Once it's, you have that column mass, what's left is a double integral, which is what you've just done a bunch of. So right now, I'm supposed to be able to walk off and say, you're on your own, because you've done this before. Okay, but let me remind you that once you have your column, what you ought to do is come back and look at the region over which these columns exist. Let me quickly try to sketch that in. Let's see. Here's the base of my column, dx by dy. We've done this problem before, so I'm going to whip right through it. For the base of the column with x, y, and 0 coordinates for its center, 
we could, for example, I've already said it, add first in the y direction. Well, we've done it, so let me just quickly do it again. That means you have to solve for y. And from the ellipse that you see over there, that would be equivalent to what you see here. Negative to plus. And once you have these things, then you add the x direction. That's uh, minus 2 radical 3 to plus 2 radical 3. Again, I'm doing this quickly because these are your old double integral limits of integration. There's nothing fancy there. But to complete the story, block mass added vertically gives you column mass. Added in the y direction gives you slab mass. That's an old term I've used. And then finally added in the x direction, the slab like baloney add up to the whole chunk. You get the entire mass. My last words before we get something else here. If you have a problem that deals with three dimensions, use triple integrals. If it's a two-dimensional lamina problem, use double integrals. Okay? The thing that's going to confuse you in the book is they'll say, do volume using a triple integral. And you say, well, why are we doing that? We did volumes with a double integral. Well, that's because you kind of cheated. If the density for my solid were constantly, let's say, 1, then the mass of that solid would be also equal to its volume. Think of that. If the density is 1, the mass would equal the volume. What happens is that you don't have to integrate anything here. dz becomes z. You put in your limits of integration. You get top surface minus bottom surface integrated over a plane region. That's your old double integral. So when we use double integrals for volumes, we cheated. We actually should have used a triple integral, but because it becomes a double integral almost instantaneously, uh, it works out nicely that way. But from my point of view, if I were to ask you for a volume, I would still set it up as a triple integral. It just seems more natural. If I ask you for a mass, you are stuck with triple integrals because this density is going to change throughout the solid in all three directions. There's no way in those general situations that you can kind of cheat and make it into a double integral you will, in fact, have to add in three directions to get that done. That means triple integrals. Okay, again, the, the problem with these, of course, is evaluating them, no doubt about it, but I'm going to key mostly in the next couple of days on setting up proper limits of integration. So go back and review your polar coordinates for those problems we just had. Also go back and look at your quadric surfaces. What is a hyperboloid of two sheets? We talked about it many weeks ago, about eight weeks ago. I'm sure you've forgotten. We're going to have to look at those again. Okay, to finish up today, what I'd like to do is show you a little bit more animation as to what's going on here. I talked about columns moving, or I should say blocks moving up and down and left and right, etc. Let's roll, again, a computer graphics representation of just such a summation process. And maybe with a little extra color and motion, you can see what's going on. To set up and apply a multiple integral, it helps to see the surfaces involved as boundaries within which volume elements are added. As a simple example, we want to find the volume between this surface and the square in the xy plane. In Cartesian coordinates, the volume elements are rectangular boxes of dimension dx by dy by dz. When stacked vertically, these boxes form rectangular columns. When the columns are stacked horizontally, we have a slab of volume. <laughs> what you just saw were the, we can't hear it, but there's some sound that says those blocks were just added up underneath. What we've done is quit the blocks now, and those are the columns that you would get created from blocks. We're just adding from left to right. This goes fairly slowly, unfortunately. Uh, but like I said, the colors are pretty. Those columns there, in fact, are what you did back in double integrals. <coughs> if you find the volume under a surface, you took a column of volume, which is homogeneous, and added them up underneath the surface. Now, this is one direction. In fact, this is basically what your computer program.
Adding these slab volumes yields an approximation to the volume under the surface. Generally, the smaller the bases of the columns and the more columns used, the better the approximation. In the limit, as base area goes to zero and the number of columns increases without bound, the approximating sum approaches a limit, a definite double interval, which equals the volume we seek. Applications of multiple integrals abound, as well as methods for their evaluation.